In The Witcher 3, you use swords, signs, and a pea shooter to find and rescue everybody's favourite virtual assistant, Siri. What if you didn't want to use them? Could you still finish the game? Well, let's find out. Can you beat The Witcher 3 with only your fists? Before we can set out to save Siri from the Lich King, let's talk about the rules, shall we? Rule number one. This should be fairly obvious, but we can only use fists to damage our enemies. And this should be the only rule, but I'm a glutton for punishment, so let's make it a little bit more challenging, shall we? Rule two. Gelt is a witcher, not a pussy, so we're playing on deathmatch difficulty, and if that wasn't challenging enough, signs cannot be used for this playthrough, the only exception being when outside of combat, to do things like break a wall. In an effort to make Jonnyson's proud as well, we won't be wearing any clothes. And lastly, we're not going to be using any potions or decoctions. And with the rules laid out, it's time to get into the run. After getting crabs from Yennefer, we are immediately confronted with our first challenge of the run. Our fists are hitting as hard as an angry toddler, which isn't exactly ideal since the ghouls start to regen when they get low enough. After dying a couple of times to the very first enemy of the game, I left Vesemir and ran off on an adventure, which conveniently for us skips needing to fight them. On the way we were rudely interrupted by some guy screaming for help, as if being attacked by a griffin is our problem. Cutscene Geralt pulled a sword out of the void and landed a hit, and this is of course where I insert a shit tier joke about failing the run. After speaking to God about lilac and gooseberries, we gave some peasants a good 3 on 1 fisting session. This wasn't part of the game, this was just an average Saturday night for me. Before heading to the Nilfgaard camp, I picked up a place of power. With the skill point collected, we were able to get the very thing that was going to carry us for the rest of the run, making up for our sheer incompetency, and also preventing many, many deaths. Gourmet essentially gives us an unlimited way to regen health in combat without the use of potions. Once we got into the camp, the Nilfgaardian captain proved to us that he had eyes and correctly identified that we were indeed not a dwarf. He had information on our blackhead dominatrix, but of course he wasn't giving it up for free. We set out to collect some resources to hunt the not-so-friendly neighbourhood griffin. Turns out the black ones made a severe and continuous lapse of judgement and hunted the griffin's partner, which of course turned them into a feathery John Wick, going on a rampage stopping at nothing to get revenge. With the bait collected, it was time to fight the first boss of the run. And it was not looking good. If it wasn't bad enough that we were only doing 6 damage per hit and getting staggered every time, occasionally the griffin would decide it was more convenient to be in the air, and if it wasn't obvious enough that means we can't do shit. This does however give us a nice tea break to get some health back and complete various household chores before it lands again. After 5 deaths, that conveniently happened just after save points during the fight, and a painful 2 hours of raw concentrated fisting and rolling, the griffin was finally low. Geralt was ready to deliver the final blow, until that little bitch Vesemir, after doing absolutely fuck all the entire fight other than hide in a corner, ran in and stole the kill. Don't worry, he will pay for this crime later. With the griffin dead, we gave some juicy head to the captain. In exchange for killing the griffin, we finally learned where Yennefer was. While preparing to leave White Orchard, we were surrounded by an army of sims when we stood up for the bartender, and had no choice but to fight our way out. Using only our fists and totally not a sword, we gently removed a guy's head, and we were forced to leave. As we were leaving, we just so happened to bump into Yen, who had joined forces with Nilfgaard. We endured Amir's pretentious bullshit for long enough to get the leads we needed on Siri and quickly left. Entering Velen, we went to the nearest inn like a true alcoholic and did some shots with the boys. The innkeeper kindly helped us find Hendrik, who conveniently had information about where Siri was. Before leaving, I grabbed some food and went on my way to find the agent. Arriving at the location, it appeared that the wild hunt had beaten us to it. Hendrik was not so conveniently dead. Luckily for us though, searching his body gave us a key. The key let us into this stalker's basement. Searching more, we learned a bit about what Siri got up to in Velen, and we went on our way to talk to the Baron. On the way, however, a white knight put me in my place, and I didn't even stand a chance. With our head hanging in shame, we made it to the Baron and of course he tasked us with finding his family. In return, he would tell us about his encounter with Ciri. The Baron's henchmen were attacking the Pella, which wasn't very nice since we needed him to help their boss. What I didn't know is that the guy was a member of Faze Clan, and I was going to be a part of his next montage. We saved the Pella and were informed that the Baron had been a bit of a wrong'un, and it was up to us to politely show him the error of his ways. How, you might ask? by savagely beating and waterboarding him. Now that the wife beater was put in line, I decided to say hi to the local witch and see what we could find out. On the way, a group of five neckers gave us some nice five on one action, which reminds me of a certain meme. We found the local witch and watched her take a bath for plot reasons and absolutely no other reason whatsoever. With Kira's assets at our side, we headed out to find Siri's contact. 
This plan quickly took a turn since the group of Death Knight cosplayers beat us to the cave. Following them through the cave was surprisingly not an issue since we could skip fighting nearly all of the enemies. All we had to do was use some non-lethal bombs on some rats' nests, since an all-powerful sorceress was incapable of dealing with them herself. But going deeper into the cave we stumbled into a golem that the elven mage had set up to protect the area, which proved to be less of a defence system and acted as more of a punching bag standing in a corner until it died. Once passed, we finally caught up to the Wild Hunt. They, quite fittingly, did not give us a warm welcome. They summoned a few portals, summoning everybody's favourite white powder to stop us. And this is the exact moment we couldn't progress any further into the cave. The portals had the lovely addition of spawning Hounds of the Wild Hunt to attack us. Which shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, the Hounds just like ghouls regenerate health. And unfortunately for us, we don't have anywhere near enough power to outdamage their healing. Defeated, I loaded a previous save and planned out my next moves. I decided it was a good idea to go to Novigrad first and maybe get some more XP before heading back to Velen, despite being 6 levels behind the recommended level. Once in Novigrad we watched some locals get burned at the stake for daring to play Hogwarts Legacy, and promptly began our search for Triss. At her house I made the mistake of trying to fight a group of thieves, after punching them for about a minute and seeing their health bar move at the pace of an arthritic old man, I decided to take the pacifist route, and used Geralt's maxed out charisma stat to avoid the fight. Looking back, this should have been the moment where I turned back and looked for another way to progress. However, I didn't do that, and we instead made our way to the King of Beggars, where the bouncers stole our non-existent weapons. Once inside we found Triss who led us to collect our Amazon package which got lost in transit. In the process we ended up trapped in some guy's house with no way out. To escape, we went through the cellar which happened to contain a drowner with more firepower than the US military. With nowhere to turn back, the only way out was to fight. This cellar is where I spent the next five and a half hours of my life. For reference, this run took about 50 hours, meaning this one fight took 10% of the total playthrough time to beat. My attention span was too short to keep dodging for such a long time, and it was the cause of many, many deaths. One mistake and I was dead. Triss was as useful as a broken condom during this section and decided to stand there with a fireball in hand instead of helping in any capacity. At one point, she even body blocked me into the drowner before killing it herself. Not going to lie, I had to take a break after this one. Eleven deaths later though, I was finally able to get it low enough for Triss to finish the job, and we could finally get out of the sewer. We collected Triss's illegal goods and went to try and help her clear out some rats. A few deaths to the witch hunters later, and my senses came back to me. I decided to go back to Velen and do things in the intended order. Now that we are back in Velen, it was time to help the Baron, and since we don't have signs at our disposal, deleting this fetus was not going to be an option, which come to think of it is kind of fitting given this is a Polish game. 40 minutes of pounding wraiths and no deaths later, the escort quest was complete. Following the Lubberkin was boring, but at least it showed us where the Baron's family went to. But the Baron wasn't exactly pleased to hear what we had to say. As penance for his sour attitude, I decided to do what any rational person would do, and smash him in a game of Gwent. Before we could continue our adventures in Velen, we needed to make a not so quick detour to collect every place of power on the map. All of this effort was just so we could unlock the skill efficiency, which increases our maximum number of bombs by one for each point. With this trek out of the way, we could finally, for the last time, get back on track with the story and once again made our way to Velen. Returning to Velen for the third time, we watched Kira take a bath again, and quickly sped through back to where we previously left off. The portals are exactly the reason we need the efficiency skill before we could continue. It turns out that using bombs on the portals prevents the hounds from spawning, and you can just skip the fighting entirely. Don't worry, these bombs don't do damage, so it doesn't break the rules. Now that Kira had broken the ice, we reached the Nithral fight. This was another super easy fight for the most part. His attacks were slow, and he didn't really do much of anything. The main issue came from these little shits that he spawned throughout. The health regen actually wasn't the main issue here. Our face was doing enough damage to kill them by this point. The issue comes when they decide to phase into the wall, making them impossible to hit. No matter how much we hit the walls of our gamer rage and monster energy, we just couldn't reach them. Some good did come out of this fight though. I discovered that using strong attacks on the hounds almost doubled our DPS. I know right? Strong attacks hit harder? Who would have thought? With our newfound knowledge, Nithril went down and we could now help the Baron for one last time, by finding his wife. Entering into the swamp, we met a group of children that wanted to play hide and seek. We, of course, accepted, and probably got put on an FBI watch list in the process. Using our witcher senses made finding the children incredibly easy, and we were able to learn more about our boy Johnny. The path to Johnny was filled with drowners and waterhogs, but fighting them wasn't too much of a challenge, just time consuming. We found Johnny and had to help him recover his voice. 
Johnny's voice was protected by a bunch of mosquitoes atop a hill, and this is the point where I really started to miss having a crossbow, or any decent amount of damage at all just to deal with them. Johnny got his voice back and with it helped us persuade Gran to introduce us to the crones. The crones tasked us with something only a witch or a lumberjack could deal with. Geralt had to fight a tree. Once at the tree we did a bit of parkour to skip fighting the fairy guarding the entrance. We made no hesitation to attack the tree's heart, which only took a few hits to destroy, officially making this fight the easiest enemy in the game to beat, with the only drawback of pissing off climate activists. With the spirit gone and payment collected, we returned to the crones and learned more about Siri. The crones were thirsty then at e-girl's comment section on Twitter. After we returned to the Baron, we let him know his wife is in another castle and cannot leave. He obviously wasn't thrilled with this, but still stuck to his word and told us what he knew about Siri. She left for Novigrad and it was time for us to do the same. With Velen behind us, we returned to Triss to catch some rats and commit several counts of murder. Despite not being underleveled, the fight versus the Witch Hunters was far from easy, mostly because the controls in combat in this game are absolute horseshit. As you can see by me trying to dodge an attack, and instead Carol jumping up and down on the spot pretending to be a fucking pogo stick, purely because they're a set of stairs. It also doesn't help that Triss doesn't deal any damage. But with a lot of frustration and plenty of deaths later, we were eventually able to overcome this challenge. We parted ways with Triss and went to take a nap. We had a dream about everybody's favourite Johnny Depp, and we had to find him. When we woke up, the dreamer coincidentally happened to know that he had inherited the Rosemary in time. Entering the tavern, Geralt and Zoltan went on a rampage beating up some friendly people that made themselves a little too comfortable. With the vagrants gone, we started searching through Dandelion's personal belongings, like the good friend that we are. Reading his planner left us with a list of names that he had spoken to, which of course were all female in true dandelion fashion. Going down the list of people took some time. We first met up with Vespula, but a group of Horson's henchmen were giving her some trouble. They dressed like clowns in what could be more fitting than giving them the punch line. After that low hanging pun, we headed to our next maiden, Elihal, which in a crazy plot twist turned out to be a guy. He did have a shop though which let us buy the item that was going to make our suffering much more bearable. This fabulous mask. Now that we had our beak, we can go deal with the others. Some horse racing later, we had one person left to deal with, Rosa. There was only one issue with her. We had to beat Rosa in a sword fight. This is the only instance in the game in the main story is Geralt where you cannot sheave your sword and use your fists. It's as if using your fists as the only means of doing damage wasn't exactly planned for by the devs. You know what is planned for by the devs though? Being absolutely terrible at the game. If you lose the fight to Rosa, the quest will progress regardless. The game even gives you a chance at redemption, giving you a second chance to fight Rosa. For obvious reasons, she won't do nil. With all the info gathered and our pride destroyed, we went to listen to some music at the local inn and got accused of murder by the innkeeper we protected earlier although I'm not sure how she recognised me through my disguise. Luckily, the bard bailed us out and it was time to go get Junior. We had a relatively warm welcome by Dijkstra to the bath house, even if his friends were not so enthusiastic about us being there. Horson's men rudely broke into the bath house, but were quickly stopped when most of the thugs died from natural causes. Cleaver was pissed. His soapy bath time with the boys had been interrupted, and Junior needed to pay for such a crime. As much as I would love to help, he needed to wait for a moment while we turned Triss into the Witch Hunters. Her causing our death earlier was just completely unforgivable, and she had to face the consequences for her actions. After a brief conversation with Mengo while listening to the blissful sounds of fingernails being removed, we learned where our boy Dandelion was imprisoned. Unfortunately, Trace decided his free trial of living had come to an end before we could get Dandelion released. I guess he could say being a witch hunter is a cutthroat profession. Now that Triss had been appropriately punished, it was time to deal with Junior's thugs, First up, we went to his casino, where we almost immediately died. Taking things excruciatingly slow, we punched our way through the thugs and learned more info about Junior. We repeated this for the arena, but for some reason, the AI of the enemies here is more fucked than a Kanye West interview. They just stand there, letting you kill them one at a time. Wearing our bed mask, we slowly pecked our way at their health, until eventually the arena was all clear. The mask doesn't actually do anything. It just gives me an excuse to fit bird based puns into the script wherever possible. With information gathered on Junior's alliance with Radovid, we turned over what we knew to Dijkstra, who sent us on our way. We walked in on the king playing with himself. In an attempt to get us to forget what we saw, he revealed where Junior was hiding. Now that the simple part of finding Junior was over, it was time to actually get to him. 
There were so many guards at Juni's hideout ready to give us a beatdown, and boy did we get beard. Running circles like it was dead by daylight, and slowly picking them off was going to be our only option. Surprisingly, we only died four times at this part, and it didn't even take too much time either. With the goons relocated to heaven, we could finally confront the only man with a worse track record than Andrew Turk. He told us what he knew about Siri, and we quickly put an end to him, off screen. With the junior dead, we had one last thing to do before we could free Dandelion. That's right, we had to perform a play. We looked a bit out of place in our underwear and mask, but the people loved it. They couldn't even wait for the end of show meet and greet. Coincidentally, we found our good friend Dudu in the crowd, who would be very useful in our plan. With all the pieces in place, we interrupted the delivery of Dandelion and pursued his captor on horseback. I died to fall damage trying to get into the secret passage, but the Witch Hunter went down without much difficulty, despite what the death counter might suggest. With Johnny Depp free, we had a nice chance to catch up and learn what he knows about Siri. Turns out, Hare and Depp managed to piss off the majority of Novigrad, and had to flee from Horson's men to Temple Isle. After totally not dying as Siri, she teleported away, Dandelion was captured, the flashback ended, and we could now set out to search Skellige, which was probably the least interesting part of the playthrough. Not much of not happened, so fair warning this will be brief. The moment we got to Skellige, we did some accidental parkour in Yennefer's room, got dressed for the wake of the recently deceased king, and once inside immediately took them off again. Every party needs a stripper after all. One of the party guests got a bit handsy, so naturally we went and delivered some Skellige justice. Yennefer encouraged us to get up to some illegal activities, which ended well. In an effort to assert dominance in front of Yennefer during our crime spree, I fought a bunch of stuffed animals and stole the mask she was after. The mask was protected by a glorified rock, which we punched for a few minutes, and just like that, the party was over. An unkillable foglet did come to fuck with our mission though, so I had to reload a sieve. But other than that, we didn't die a single time for the rest of the main quest here. We followed Yennefer like a lost dog while she pissed off the locals and ruined a garden. A dead guy temporarily came back to life to tell us about Ciri, and that a curse-afflicted being was the key to finding her. And that was it, Skellige was finished. I never realised just how short Skellige was until this playthrough, but I'm not complaining. We went to collect Uma, the most attractive British person from Crow's Perch, before setting out to Kaer Morhen. Doing fetch quests for Yen wasn't exactly the most exciting thing to happen, even if it did consume two hours of my life, since using your fists as a weapon in this game probably extends their life expectancy. But despite how little damage we were doing, Lambert somehow did even less, and he was using a sword. We watched Yen perform cosmetic surgery on Uma, resulting in a much more attractive, taller elf who gave us a cool floating ball of light that was going to guide us to Siri. At this point, we were a few levels behind the next quest, and I didn't feel like repeating the same ass pounding I received in Novigrad, so it was time to do some side quests. I decided to start with searching for Philip right at her hideout, which seemed simple enough, until we died while using a portal which I guess explains why Geralt feels the need to bring up his hatred for portals in every other line of dialogue. We lied to Radovid about Philippa, saying she left to get milk and cigarettes, and quickly made our way to Skellige to roleplay as Dr. Phil, in an attempt to help a dysfunctional family. How are we going to do that, you might be asking? By doing what any rational person would do, by throwing a baby at high speeds into an oven of course. Through the power of being the main character, this worked flawlessly, and all we got from it was being called a bottom by Ceres. We continued doing side quests and went to kill an ice giant. Along the way, we saved a bearded bloke from some trolls through the power of riddles and experienced an interesting bug. And by interesting, I of course mean annoying in every way possible. Using the horn wall horn usually makes all sirens in an area fall to the ground, which lets you attack them easily. Now, for some reason, if you are using your fists and not a sword, you aren't allowed to attack them for a solid five seconds. And instead, Geralt just sits there and waits, spewing the same voice lines repeatedly. The giant itself was surprisingly easy to beat, and didn't put up much of a fight. Its attacks did nearly no damage, it moved slowly, and most importantly, it didn't have much health, but was an excellent source of XP. We returned to Krak to collect our reward, and helped with the spontaneous bear infestation. Now that we were caught up on XP, we invited a bunch of friends to come help us fight the Wild Hunt, and set off to Epstein's Island. Once on the isle, we followed the firefly, which led us to a small hut occupied by a group of dwarves, who would only let us in if we found their friends. Unfortunately for us, the only friend that survived fell asleep every five seconds while escorting him. Eventually, we made our way back to the hut and the dwarves let us in. And with that, we found Siri. Our boat got stolen, so we had to teleport back to Kaer Morhen instead, and prepared for the battle. Triss did this cool flying fire sword thing, which was the only useful thing she has done this run. Our strategy for the fight was simple. 
We ran around like a little bitch and let everybody else do the work. Sort of similar to that one kid in a group project that does none of the work but takes all the credit. Mousesack was the true MVP carrying us through this part of the playthrough. The gas pockets he created on the floor made shorter work of anything that went near them. 30 minutes of ballerina dancing later, the battle came to an end, and so did Vesemir's life, which was karma for stealing our griffin kill earlier. Siri, in a last ditch effort, started playing Nickelback songs causing the wild hunt to retreat and Eskel's ears to start bleeding. Now that the fight and the funeral were over, I tried to cheer up Siri by absolutely destroying her in a snowball fight. She had good fun though, and that's what matters. After a hug and a bit of sleep, Siri awoke us to go on a crusade to avenge our loss. She heard from her elf friend that one of the generals of the Wild Hunt would be in Velen to attempt to get some bitches. We showed up to the Bald Mountain and were immediately met with hostility by the locals. Some guy on a huge power trip rivaling that of an American police officer couldn't resist pointing a crossbow at us the moment we sat down. Swiftly moving away from the psycho, I momentarily went diving into a cave to collect a coin. After all, a witcher will do anything for the coin. With our passage granted, we handed the coin to Fugus before killing him to warm up for what was to come. At this point, Geralt and Ciri split up. She was to take on the crones. Geralt, on the other hand, was left to deal with Imlarith. And oh my god, I was not ready for what I was about to face. Going into this fight, I was filled with confidence that this was going to be easy. In my first casual playthrough, he put up no challenge at all, but boy was I wrong. Imlarith has two phases. In his first phase, he has a shield. This isn't exactly great for us since it makes dealing damage all the more infuriating. If you thought this was the only annoying part of the first phase, then you're dead wrong. It turns out if you land too many hits in a row, he will stun you with his shield, meaning you will nearly always get hit. Which to be fair isn't too bad, since his hits don't do a whole lot. Getting distance from him makes him teleport, which gives him this nice frosty effect reducing damage taken by half, making our fists go from stinging like a bee to stinging like a butterfly. With enough patience though, the first phase was very manageable. We had reasonable opportunities to hit him, and getting hit ourselves wasn't too punishing. The same couldn't be said about Phase 2 though. He drops his shield and doesn't hold back. Him teleporting around made getting hits much less frequent on an already slow boss fight. With attempts taking upwards of 30 minutes just to get him to Phase 2, I thought I'd be stuck here for a long while. To my surprise though, on my 6th attempt, it suddenly clicked. Phase 2 turned from an insufferable torment and agony into a weird game of Dance Dance Revolution, and I was enjoying it. It felt incredibly satisfying to go from dying immediately in the first phase, to eventually learning the patterns and slowly chipping away his health. Eventually we killed Imlarith, met back up with Siri, and could breathe a sigh of relief. We made our way to Novigrad to begin final preparations, which was definitely an experience to say the least. Geralt thought that using his Witcher senses in a fight was much more important than blocking when fighting this guard, while trying to steal some horses. After committing more crimes with Ciri, we managed to catch Philippa with ease, and in celebration, I shoved Deekstra aside forcefully. With those parts done, this meant the last thing left to deal with was the Yennefer, where we ran into a few problems. Firstly, I died from being chain-stunned underwater by a water hag. I couldn't find the missing mechanism part thanks to having the observational skills of a blind man. And lastly, to get into the prison, we had to get past this group of ghouls. As we'll end at the very start of the playthrough, Killing ghouls was not exactly a viable option. I tried leading the ghouls far enough away to drop combat and sneak past without having to fight them, but they weren't having any of it. So in a desperate attempt, I took one of them to the side and just started punching. To my surprise, this actually worked, and we could make our way inside the prison. With the final preparations done, reaching a nice 69 deaths on the death counter, and Dijkstra crippled, it was time for the endgame. We did a couple more fetch quests that weren't really worth discussing. In the process, Siri got a change of clothes at the request of Twitch chat. Karen Thea was our next target. Quickly speeding across the fight arena, skipping past any enemy in our way, we faced Karen Thea as Siri and managed to do a decent chunk of damage before teleporting away. Now for the fun part. It was time for us to deal with him as Geralt. This motherfucker hit hard. And to make matters worse, he also slows us. So even if we don't die to the initial attack, we can still die to any follow-up. With him spawning golems at any chance he could get, we had to keep dodging continuously, in a similar way to how I dodge my responsibilities. A golem gave us a clean right hook making Mike Tyson proud, killing us immediately. After a few attempts, I started to get a strategy down. Whenever three golems were alive at once, I would stand behind them and let Karen Thea participate in some friendly fire to free up some space for myself. I started to get into a rhythm with the dodging, nailing the timing of my rolls most of the time, and I think the game knew that, so it stopped me in the most CD Project Red way possible, with bugs. 
Sometimes when spawning a golem, the portal wouldn't disappear, making the game borderline unplayable. Going near the portal would cause a very loud continuous noise and my FPS would drop a lot. This wouldn't be completely awful if this stayed in one place, that'd be too convenient wouldn't it? Throughout the fight, with this bug, the radius of the FPS drops, and the noise would get larger and larger, effectively reducing the arena size until the game was completely unplayable. After losing not one but two attempts to this, I was kind of heartbroken, thinking that the only thing that was going to stop me in this challenge was a bug that I had no control over. In the meantime, Twitch chat gave me some great words of wisdom to help with my pain. Geralt can give me a fisting any day. Thanks for that one. My morale was at its lowest at this point during the challenge, thinking that everything came down to pure luck, hoping that a bug didn't happen. Thankfully, in some sort of miraculous turn of events, a bug did happen. Caranthir decided to do his best stepsister impression and got stuck, but unfortunately for him, Stepbro wasn't here to get him out. I was tempted to reset the fight and beat him properly, but I decided to count it since losing another attempt to a bug might have just broken me. With Caranthir now dead, we went to beat Eridan, and honestly this fight was kind of disappointing. In my first attempt, I found out that he can actually damage himself with his abilities. Yep, this is the final boss of Witcher 3 everybody. There isn't really anything to talk about here, he just killed himself. After his suicidal episode, we had one last thing to do. Go up the mountain and die of hypothermia because I have room temperature IQ and somehow forgot to stay near Yennefer. We let Ciri go to deal with the White Frost and with that we answered the question, can you beat the Witcher 3 with only your fists? Yes you can, and with surprisingly few deaths as well. This challenge was surprisingly a lot of fun to record and make. Subscribe if you liked this and want to see more. Let me know in the comments any suggestions you might have, or what you want to see next. I plan to stream my future runs on Twitch, so if that's something you want to see, I'll leave a link below.